Thank you everyone for joining us today. At this time, I would like to invite Alejandro to give a very brief update on how to access translation services for this program. Alejandro. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Hola a todos, gracias por tenerme aquí con ustedes. Eh, como siempre, nos gustaría participar en el idioma de nuestro corazón, así que por favor asegúrense de eh, seleccionar el globo de icono o mundo en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Eh, cuando ya esté disponible la interpretación, lo van a ver después de estas instrucciones. Después de escoger el icono de globo o mundo, van a seleccionar el español y poner el audio original en mudo. Esa opción, esa opción está justo abajo. Y también intentaremos enviar estas instrucciones en escrito, los mensajes de chat por si les ayuda. Um, and as always, we want to make sure that everybody is able to participate in the language of their heart. So if you'd like to uh, continue participating in English throughout the entirety of this event, you can go ahead and select the globe icon on the bottom right hand side of your screen. You don't see it yet, but you will after these instructions. Once that turns on, uh, you'll be able to click on that globe icon, select English, and then hit mute original audio right below that. Um, and we'll try to send this in the chat in writing as well, in case that's helpful for anybody. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. It's my pleasure to welcome Leah White, who is the ADL Texoma Associate Regional Director. Leah. Thank you and hello everybody. And thank you for joining us for the ADL Central Division Speaker Series Program, Securing Justice at the Ballot, historic and current efforts to restrict ballot access. A little bit about ADL. ADL is a leading anti-hate organization that was founded in 1913 in response to an escalating climate of anti-Semitism and bigotry. Today, ADL is the first call when acts of anti-Semitism occur and continues to fight all forms of hate. ADL is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization. Our focus is on ensuring that people have free and fair access to voting, not on telling them who to vote for. To that end, our voting rights advocacy focuses on making sure that people know how and when to vote, that they are actually able to do so, and on combating, combating misinformation and disinformation about the election process. Our voting rights advocacy work dates back decades, including being part of the founding of our Dallas office. In order to have a distraction-free program, participant mics and videos have been turned off. I am sure there'll be many questions today, and we have set aside time for questions and answers towards the end of the program. Simply submit your questions via the question and answer section at any point during the session. We are honored to have voting rights experts among us today. Um, I will briefly introduce them before we get the conversation started. Today, we are joined by Secretary of State Gen for Colorado, Jenna. Griswold, Jenna Griswold, I'm sorry. In 2018, Jenna Griswold was elected as the first Democratic Secretary of State in Colorado in 60 years. She became the first Democratic woman Secretary of State in Colorado's history. Jenna has been able to lead and work with the legislature to pass one of the largest democracy reform packages in the nation as Secretary of State. Jenna grew up in a working class family in rural Colorado and was the first person in her family to attend a four year college and then law school. She knows firsthand how important it is for every vote to count and for every Coloradan's voice to be heard, no matter their background or income. She is fighting to protect our right to vote, stop secret political spending, improve transparency, and stand up to those who try to bend the rules or break the law. Jenna is a rising star in Colorado politics, serving as the youngest statewide elected official in Colorado. Having received her JD from Penn, she started her legal career practicing international anti-corruption law, and then began working on elections as a voter protection attorney for President Obama. Jenna also served as the director of the governor's DC office, where she fought for Colorado's interests. One of the things she is most proud of is helping bring back hundreds of millions of dollars of relief when the 2013 floods hit Northern Colorado. After her tenure in Washington, Jenna moved back to Colorado and opened up her own small business, a legal practice. Despite a pandemic and devastating wildfires, in 2020, Secretary Griswold successfully oversaw the largest general election in Colorado state history with 94% of voters casting their ballot using the mail or a ballot drop box. In 2020, the Secretary of State's office successfully led efforts to expand mail ballot access nationwide. 
Her office engaged with nearly all 50 states to share Colorado's experience and ensure that other election officials could, save, could run safe and accessible elections. Ellie Mistal is the nation's justice correspondent covering the courts, the criminal justice system and politics and the force behind the magazine's monthly column, Objection. He is also an Alfred Nobler Fellow at the Type Media Center. His first book, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution, was published on March 1st. Ms. Stahl is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, a former associate at Du Bois and Plimpton, and a lifelong New York Mets fan. One of these is not like the other. Prior to joining the nation, Ms. Stahl was the executive editor of Above the Law. He is a frequent guest on MSNBC and Sirius XM. Will Wilder is a senior fellow in the Brennan Center's Democracy Program, where he focuses on voting rights litigation and felony rights restoration. Wilder earned his JD from Columbia Law School, where he was the editor-in-chief of the Columbia Human Rights Law Review and a research assistant for Professor Bernard Harcourt. While in law school, Wilder interned with the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Washington Lawyers Committee. Prior to law school, Wilder was a Coro Fellow in St. Louis and worked for Jason Candler's United States Senate campaign. Wilder grew up in Birmingham, Alabama and earned his BA from Washington University in St. Louis. And rounding out our panel is Karen Levitt, our moderator for today's conversation. Karen serves as National Civil Rights Counsel for the ADL. She advocates on a range of civil rights issues, including voting rights, immigrant and refugee rights, and LGBTQ plus rights, and advises ADL's regional, state, and federal engagement on civil rights issues. Previously, she represented young people in family court proceedings as a staff attorney with the Legal Aid Society of New York. She has published work in Above the Law and The Guardian, the quarterly law journal of the National Association of Counsel for Children. Karen earned her JD from the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. She earned her BA from the City College of New York, Magna Cum Laude, where she was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. Welcome everybody. The floor is now yours, Karen. Somehow this long into COVID. Um, thank you, Leah. And thank you to the Central Division for inviting me to moderate this really important discussion. We do have a lot to cover, so let's get to it. Um, I just want to confirm, do we have Secretary Griswold here? Yes, no, maybe we'll work on that. Um, all right, we'll jump into it and then we'll circle back. Uh, because for our first an uh, question, uh, Secretary Griswold will not be the first person to answer. So in the 2022 midterms, what obstacles do you think are likely to face voters and election administrators? We are hoping to get answers from all of our panelists, but Ellie, if you could go first. Yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, for the question, Karen. Thank you so much to the Anti-Defamation League for having me. Really excited to be here. I'm sorry to be joining you on such a horrible day um, in American uh, uh, legal life. Um, when it when it comes to the obstacles that people are going to face, I always have st struggle answering this question because I feel like if I say anything less than like crocodiles will be snapping at their heels as they jump over pits in an attempt to like unless it's ratcheted up to some level, there are going to be people in this world who are like, eh, whatever. People have gone through worse to vote voting is a privilege and like like unless the I, I it's hard to express the kinds of obstacles um that people will face that will prevent them from voting unless they are highly motivated to vote because the people who generally talk about this are highly motivated to vote they tend to downplay the obstacles um facing people who are not but with that as a caveat, with that as an understanding, as a baseline of what we're talking about, um, the first and most obvious obstacle people will face is that they won't know where or when to vote. Because the information about where their polling place is will be different. It will have changed between the last election or perhaps from the last time they actually went to vote. Um, because of COVID restrictions, things that were open are going to be closed. Things that were closed last time were going to be open. That's going to get all, all whirled around. The process for applying 
for an absentee ballot is going to be different to say nothing for the process of actually filling one out, whether or not you have to request one, whether or not you can request one for any reason or no reason at all. The days in which early voting will be available in your state will have changed from the last election or the election before that. Where you have to go to early vote will be different from where you have to go to regular vote. So if you voted uh, uh, on election day in 2020, but wanted to early vote for the midterms or vice versa, those are probably going to be two different places. And all of this will confuse and suppress the vote. All of this will mean that people who do want to vote, who do want to make their voice heard in these midterm elections will be shunted or pushed off or, or inconvenienced or disenfranchised. That's the obstacle that people will, will, will face. It will be a lack of reliable, consistent, frictionless information and opportunity to go exercise their constitutional right to participate in the democracy. And, and in Florida, probably crocodiles. I mean, I don't know for, I mean, alligators, I guess, is technically the word, but like, you know, something like that. There's some biologists who might point out that there is actually a distinction between the two. <laughs> um, Will, if you could weigh in, and also the second part of the question, how this will affect election administrators as well. Um, sure, Karen, thanks for the question, and, and thanks to ADL for, for having us all today. I know it's a difficult day to be talking about the courts and civil rights for a lot of reasons. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I hope this event provides some useful information to everybody. Uh, I would, I think, kind of categorize the three threats I see to voters this fall uh, into three different categories. The first is, um, you know, voter suppression, what we, what we call voter suppression, which is, you know, efforts to make it more difficult to vote. Uh, and I think the biggest new category of restrictions that voters are unfortunately going to see in a lot of states this fall is barriers to casting mail ballots. Uh, in the 2020 election, we saw higher usage of mail ballots uh, than ever before. And I think most importantly, we saw a more diverse community of voters using mail voting in 2020. Uh, in a lot of states, mail, other than states like Colorado with very expansive mail voting policies, uh, in a lot of states before 2020, you mostly saw older white retired voters voting by mail. Uh, you saw a much younger and much more diverse um, community of voters using mail voting in 2020. And I think an unfortunate trend that we've seen in American history is that uh, rising participation among communities of color, rising participation among young people in elections is often met with uh, new restrictions on the right to vote, which is why it's not surprising that we're seeing a lot of uh, new barriers that have been thrown up in certain states this year to make it more difficult to request a mail ballot, um, like in Texas, which has uh, made it very, um, you know, put in uh, some identification matching rules that have led to a lot of mail ballot applications being rejected, uh, made it more difficult to cast a mail ballot. A number of states have, you know, limited voters options to drop their ballots off at mail ballot drop boxes or rely on uh, family members or friends to deliver their mail ballots for them. Um, and again, more difficult to have your mail ballot counted. Uh, for example, the, the same law in Texas that I referenced that um, the Brennan Center is currently engaged in, in litigation with, with ADL about uh, also requires mail ballots to uh, meet some pretty strict identification matching requirements to be counted, even once they're received. Um, so that's kind of the first big category of, of new things that I'm worried about this fall. Uh, I'm also worried about gerrymandering for this fall, which I know is not exactly a barrier to voting, but is a barrier to uh, somebody's vote having meaning. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of commentaries, kind of as the redistricting cycle has gotten towards its close, has uh, people have made the argument that, you know, the overall partisan affiliation of the U.S. House map is not changing very much. Uh, and I, I think that's not really accurate to say um, what's happening. Uh, you know, we've seen, first off, the number of competitive U.S. House seats, uh, meaning a seat that could conceivably be won by a candidate from either party in a competitive election has, is going to shrink dramatically in November um, because of the number of states that have just heavily gerrymandered almost all of the seats in their state uh, to lean heavily towards one party. Uh, you'll see that in Texas where, you know, Texas had, has had a lot of competitive U.S. House elections in the last a few election cycles, and unfortunately, I don't think it's going to have very many in the fall. 
um, because Texas just doesn't have that many competitive House districts anymore uh, under the new map that is, is also currently being challenged in court. Um, you're also seeing a, a lot of states like Texas, like Georgia, like Florida, uh, that have had um, you know, a lot of demographic change in the last 10 years and have growing communities of color in, in cities like Houston and cities like Atlanta. And uh, you're not seeing that change being reflected um, in, in the new maps that voters are going to be voting uh, to elect representatives for in November. Uh, and then finally, and I think we'll have some time to get a little more into this later, but I'm, I'm worried about the threat of uh, what we call election sabotage or election subversion this fall, uh, which is the threat of you know, something untowards happening after votes are cast that leads to the final result um, not necessarily reflecting the votes that were cast. Uh, that can mean some kind of mass disenfranchisement event where an election administrator, say, refuses to count the votes from a particular precinct in their city. Uh, that can mean a state legislature trying to reject the results of uh, the election in their state entirely. Uh, and I think that's an, unfortunately a new threat that we need to be vigilant about this November. Um, that is it's not something we've had to worry about in American democracy in a long time. Thank you both. Um, unfortunately, Secretary of State Griswold will not be able to attend today due to technical difficulties. We thank her for trying. We're certainly still more than thrilled to have Ellie and Will here and uh, happy to proceed. So I'm going to move on to our next question, which is what actions are state legislatures taking that will either expand access to voting or that are restricting access? And can you provide some examples? Let's start with Will. Um, sure. Uh, you know, I, I guess I can start with restrictive laws first and, and then talk about some good things that have happened in, in different states. Um, 2021 was unfortunately a, a banner year for new restrictions on the right to vote. The Brennan Center has been tracking uh, developments in state voting laws for a long time. Uh, and 2021 was far and away the year, at least as long as we've been tracking, with the most number of new restrictive bills introduced and the most number of new restrictive laws enacted. We saw um, 34 different laws enacted that restrict access to voting in some way in 2021. Uh, the biggest of those bills, and you know, those 34 laws are not all the same. Some of them are more minor one-off restrictions on the right to vote, and some of them are bigger, more complicated bills that restrict voting and affect election administrators in a lot of different ways. Uh, I would say I think the worst laws that we saw enacted in 2021 were uh, Texas Senate Bill 1, which I have already discussed, um, uh, a big bill in Georgia that restricts mail voting in a number of different ways, and also has some new restrictions on early voting, uh, on political campaigns, um, and on uh, nonpartisan election administration. Um, a big bill in Florida um, and a big bill in Iowa would probably be the the four you know biggest um, omnibus restrictive voting bills that we saw in 2021. We've also seen Florida and Georgia this year uh, add to those restrictions with new bills that uh, expand law enforcement's power to investigate voter fraud, uh, which is, you know, a, a conspiracy theory that studies have debunked time and time again, the idea that there's some kind of widespread fraud on our voting system. Uh, but nonetheless, Florida and Georgia have both uh, passed new laws this year to sink a lot of more resources into prosecuting these fake myths of, of fraud. Um, so as far as good things to happen, though, you know, I, I will say in, in other states, um, you know, we have seen some, some great progress on voting rights in the last two years. I, I think an unfortunate part of the story is that we are seeing new restrictive laws in states where it was already kind of difficult to vote, and we're seeing new expansive laws in states that were already doing a pretty good job, uh, leading to what I worry is a widening gap between states in the U.S. and some states where it's getting harder to vote every year and some states where it's getting easier. Um, with that being said, you know, we have seen some great bills passed. Um, uh, bills to one issue where we've had a lot of progress the last couple of years is restoring voting rights to people with previous criminal convictions. Um, you know, I, I think that's been a movement that's been very successful in a lot of states recently to make sure um, that, you know, our democracy is as reflective as it can be by making sure that, you know, a criminal conviction doesn't bar people from voting for life. Um, and that's, that's been an, an area where I think I've seen a lot of positive progress in the last couple of years in some states. Thank you. Ellie? 
<clears throat> yeah, so one thing that people need to understand is I want to bring people back to 2021, last summer, Brnovich v. Arizona. One of the things that, that the voting suppression uh, uh, advocates will tell you straight up is that their restrictive laws are targeted at minority communities because minority communities vote Democratic. All right, like that, that, that is just, that is just a, an assumption that's baked in to why they're doing their laws the way they are. So if you take something like voter ID in Arizona, right? Now, we can have an intellectual debate about whether voter ID is bad or good or, 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 or why we should have ID or whether or not we need it. Is there voter fraud? Is there not? We can have all these debates. But on the ground... The reason why they want voter ID laws in Arizona is because native communities in Arizona are much less likely to have voter ID. That's it. That's the reason. That's the reason they say in courts is the reason for, ta for, for wanting that law. Right now, the legal standard is, according to Samuel Alito, is it too racist for Samuel Alito? I mean, that's, that's I mean, literally what, what Alito is, is telling us in Brnovich is that certain acts of racism don't rise to the level of being violative of the 15th Amendment. So apparently it's racist. If it's not racist, according to Samuel Alito, I shouldn't say that. If it's not so racist that Samuel Alito has a problem with it, then your, your voting restriction is fine. That's what they're doing out in Arizona. That was last year's case. What's coming up down the pipe this year, as Will was already talking about, we've got horrible laws in Iowa, Texas, Georgia. I tend to focus on the Georgia one because the Georgia example is the most clear recent example where the emerging majority of women and people of color and people in the LGBTQ community, the emerging political uh, uh, majority kind of changed a state that usually goes one way to make it go the other way. And so the reaction has been, wham, let's restrict the ability of that emerging community uh, to have frictionless access to the ballot, right? So when they take away, so when they change the early voting days, they're specifically looking to take away days that people might go to early vote after going to church. That's targeted. That's that's why that's there, right? When they change the rules on how you can electioneer, they call it, to people standing in line uh, uh, waiting to vote, what they're trying to do is in the counties where they've already closed enough polling districts that you were going to have to wait multiple hours to execute your constitutional right to vote, what they're doing is making that experience as hard and as painful and as confusing as possible for you. Yes, the media has focused on the whole Georgia, you can't bring water to people uh, uh, standing in line, which, by the way, I think giving water to people in the South is generally a good idea that should be supported by moral, de morally decent humans. But whatever. People have focused on the water thing. But what, what the real teeth of that is, is that, you know, and I've been in these long lines. I, in, my, my, in my county, it sometimes takes a very long time uh, for, for me to vote. And one of the things that these uh, so-called electioneers are doing is just giving information to the people who are standing online. Hey, stay in line. Hey, you, you will be allowed to vote. Because you got into the line before the polls close, they have to see you in, the, in that polling station, even if we are now past the point where the polls have technically closed. So stay in line. Tough it out. It's worth it. That's the that's what people are giving uh, people who are standing in line. Emotional support. And that, more than the water, is what they're trying to take away, in, is what they're, they've successfully taken away in Georgia. So when you look kind of in broad strokes at the, 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 the voting rights restrictions, what they're, what they're trying to do is take away the will of people to overcome the hurdles that have been erected in front of them in order to go vote. It's not just the hurdles that they're uh, that they're erecting. It's the will to jump over them that they're trying to attack. Thank you both. Um, for our next question, how are election officials impacted by efforts to restrict the freedom to vote? And what can be done to protect these officials? We'll start with Will and then go to Ellie. Sure. So I, I think that's a really important question because, you know, voter suppression is unfortunately a tactic that we've been seeing for a really long time. Uh, but attacking local election officials as a way to accomplish voter suppression uh, is actually, I think, 
something pretty new that uh, we started to see since the 2020 election in a lot of ways. I mean, we all we all saw it when, um, you know, President Trump tried to pressure the Secretary of State of Georgia, tried to pressure local election officials in Michigan uh, to rescind their certification of the 2020 election or to, I think, as he said, in Georgia, find enough votes for him to win the election in Georgia. Uh, so, you know, we saw that happen and, and we're continuing to see things like that happen both legislatively and through other means um, since then. Uh, we've seen bills pass or be introduced and pass in the last two years in a lot of states um, that seem to be particularly targeting things that election officials in some states did to try and protect their voters in 2020. I uh, saw so a lot of election officials do things in 2020 um, to try and cut down on crowds at polling places during COVID, like send out mail ballot applications to everyone who is eligible as a you know, reminder that they're eligible to vote by mail instead of waiting in line at a polling place. Um, and we've seen a lot of states turn around this year and make that a crime. Uh, the bill in Texas that we've been talking about makes it a crime for election officials to solicit mail ballot applications. And I don't know what solicit means in that context. And I don't think many election officials in Texas do either. And a lot of people are very worried that, you know, some action that they take to try and make voting easier uh, within the bounds of the law in, in their county in Texas could, you know, wind up leading to them getting prosecuted and charged with a felony. Um, and Texas is not the only example. We saw Iowa pass a law uh, that makes it possible for the state to punish election officials who don't aggressively purge their voter rolls um, to, you know, remove names of voters, um, which is a, a process that could be flawed in a lot of states and lead to people getting kicked off the voter rolls, um, uh, you know, without, um, you know, any, any viable reason. Um, and, you know, even beyond these legislative threats, which are, are one entire category of things, we've also seen a, a lot of non-legislative threats to election officials um, observe uh, in the last two years. Brennan Center did a poll of election officials recently and, uh, you know, found pretty overwhelming results that many of them had been threatened in the last two years, that many of them were considering leaving their job before the 2024 election because of the threats that they were getting and because of the restrictions that were being put on them. Um, so I apologize, a uh, fire truck is driving past my window right now. Um, but, um, anyways, <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're, we've seen all kinds of threats like these against election officials. And, you know, I, I think this has to be viewed all as a sort of a, a coordinated partisan project to drive professionalized election administrators out of the profession uh, so they can be replaced with partisans who will do what um, what these legislators want them to do. Um, you know, there are things that I that I think um, could be done to protect these election officials. Uh, Congress could pass legislation, um, you know, enshrining some sort of uh, federal civil remedy for election officials or, um, you know, increasing the penalties against people who threaten them or uh, providing them protections from being removed. Um, short of passing a law, you know, it, it has been good to see that the Department of Justice seems to have uh, sort of taking a lot of these threats more seriously uh, and responding to them a little more aggressively. So I, I hope that's definitely something that we uh, continue to see happen, um, uh, you know, in the next few years as, as these threats continue. Yeah, for my, for my part, I don't know that people are always aware of just how much discretion an election official has throughout the process and even especially on the day of election on, on on actual election day right um we want election officials at least we wanted election officials up until donald trump ran for president we wanted election officials to err on the side of having people vote right that's american we want people to vote we want election officials to err on the side of having people vote but now election officials are under intense pressure to err on the side of not having people vote right so if there's a small discrepancy between your signature and the one they have on file if there's some confusion we now there's pressure on election officials to resolve that confusion against the voter as opposed to in favor of the voter and that's on the small scale on the macro scale think about all of the weird little things that happen over the course of an election day 
in our system where we don't have one election electoral system we have 50 electoral systems and quite frankly we don't have 50 electoral system we ha we have you know 3000 county based electoral systems where things go wrong sometimes the voting machine breaks what do you do then well if you have an election official who, who wants to err on the side of having people vote you're going to have to, you're going to have those polls extended to account for the fact that the machines were broken for three hours in the middle of the day. But if you live in Texas now, that's probably not going to happen. So if a machine happens to surprisingly, oh, who could have known it just happened to break in Houston for three hours, that's going to be three hours less that people in Houston have to vote, for instance. I said earlier about the example of getting in line, uh, of waiting in line. Now, as we understand the law, if you get in line before the polls close, you are allowed to vote. But now go tell that to a Trumpy election official. Well, I was in line. Polls close at 7. I got in line at 6.55. Now it's 8. I should still be allowed to vote. No, you ain't. Now, now we have election officials who are in place who either will deny that person um, the right to vote, or at least be under intense pressure to deny that person the right to vote. And that's all before we get to Will's ultimate point of election officials just discarding votes they don't like, which is now also on the table. So in terms of protecting them, part of what, what part of the difficulty in protecting these people, even the ones who are kind of, again, doing the right thing and erring on the side of letting people, letting people vote, is who, literally who is going to physically protect them in some of these states because when they go to close a poll in houston when they tell you that it's time to shut down the poll in houston even though it's not they're gonna show up with guys with guns they're gonna show up with the police and you're gonna be an election official and you're gonna do what you're gonna tan them and square that poll opening i don't think so so even when you start to think on the ground of how you're gonna protect these people it's very hard when the people who are against voting also in these states are in control of law enforcement and are in, or in control of the weaponry. Thank you both. So moving on to our next question, and mindful of time, um, how does one party rule in any state uh, affect voting laws? Yeah, Karen, it sucks is what it does i mean it doesn't and it doesn't matter which one party you happen to be in if you're in a one party state your access to voting is going to be worse i happen to live in new york it has been ruled largely by the democratic even when they elect republican governors it's ruled in large part by the democratic party the democratic primary in new york is where most of the action is at most of the time not um, the general election in November. And we have generally, it's only recently started to change, but we have generally terrible voting laws. I think as recently as like 2018, New York was like 38th on the list of, of states with good access to voting. We've finally started to ad adopt some more modern um, early voting ideas. It's still relatively difficult to get an absentee ballot in New York. It's still relatively difficult. You have to, have to register to vote much way far ahead of the actual election day in New York. New York is not a great state when it comes to voting rights. Why? Because the fewer people that vote in a one-party state, the better it is for the party officials. The better it is for the party's um, proposed candidate to win primary elections and even eventually general elections, right? Because the the the, the things that the thing that hurts incumbents, if you will, the thing that hurts uh, uh, people who haven't been blessed by the party is voter turnout. That's the only way they lose their job, right? If you have a very very small electorate, if you have, you know, I think in the New York's mayor, mayor mayoral primary, which uh, was recently won by Eric Adams, who went on to become the mayor of New York City, I think the the turnout in that primary for the Democratic primary, where there were like seven people running for mayor of New York, it was under twenty percent. It might have been like eleven percent if I'm if I, I don't don't quote me on that, but I believe it was that it was that low. It was under twenty percent, potentially under fifteen percent of turnout. For the mayor of New York, what is that? And that's in part because of restrictive voting laws. So, so when you're in a state that is non-competitive, 
um, your access to voting m is most likely worse than a state that is competitive. Because at least in a competitive state, there are occasionally the their, their countervailing interests where you, you want more people to be able to vote because you never know election to election whether or not high turnout helps your party or not. In a one party state, high turnout never helps your party. So you always want to depress voter turnout and make it difficult for people to vote. Sure, and to follow up there, I think, I, and I, I know we touched on this earlier, but I think a um, really important thing to remember about voting laws in general is that a lot of what we've seen really since the modern wave of voter suppression laws began after the 2010 uh, mid elections and then after the Shelby County versus Holder decision in 2013 made it a lot easier for states in the South, particularly to pass new restrictive voting laws, um, is we're seeing new restrictions layered on in, in places where it was already pretty hard to vote. Um, so, for example, uh, there's a, a pretty widely accepted uh, metric called the cost of voting index that a team of political scientists puts together every year that ranks how difficult it is uh, for a voter to cast a ballot in each state. Uh, it uses, uh, you know, a bunch of different objective metrics like distance, average distance to polling places, what kind of identification you have to show at the polls, and a, a long list of metrics. Um, and in 2020, before any of these voting laws passed, Texas and Georgia were number one and number two in that metric, uh, meaning that according to this objective metric, those were the two states where it was already hardest to vote in the United States. And then you know, what do you know, in 2021, we saw both of those states pass new restrictions on the right to vote, um, the states where it was already very hard to vote in the first place. And I think uh, that's just kind of an example of how, you know, long-term one-party rule in a state leads to these restrictions just piling on top of each other over time uh, and making it harder and harder to vote uh, as time goes on. And, um, you know, and, and with a lot of these laws, you know, some of these restrictive voting laws and individual provisions sound absurd on their face. Uh, and there's plenty of them also that don't sound ridiculous on their face. But when you look at it in the broader context of a state's full election code, and you see that it's only gotten harder over the last 25 years to cast a ballot, uh, then you realize that, you know, you realize what's happening here um, and realize what long-term control by one party of a state uh, can do to that state's election laws. And, and I, I think you see that in redistricting too. You saw, I know congressional redistricting is what gets talked about the most, but uh, you, know, you saw after the 2010 midterms when the Republican Party had a lot of success in state legislatures that happened to be a midterm year, uh, and you saw a lot of these states lock in really, really aggressive partisan gerrymanders after the 2010 midterms in their state legislative elections. Uh, for example, in Wisconsin, Republicans hold huge majorities in uh, both of their state legislatures because of how gerrymandered the map is, um, despite the fact that Wisconsin's elections have been really close every year, um, you know, since other than 2010, their elections have almost always been extremely close at the statewide level, but you still de see these enormous and totally unearned um, majorities uh, in the state legislature. Looking to the federal side of it, Supreme Court decisions such as Brnovich, which Ellie, you referenced earlier, can have a really significant impact on voting rights. So Ellie, can you please explain what the shadow docket is and why it matters? Sure, and just uh, FYI, it's my turn to have noise pollution. I have the long guys outside right now, so I apologize if you uh, hear um, my very uh, modest lawn being uh, manicured to the extent that it can be. Um, <laughs> Uh, in terms of the shadow docket, look, the shadow docket is our new word for the Supreme Court's emergency process, right? And we understand why there should be an emergency process because the Supreme Court is the court of final resort for the death penalty, right? So, like, if you've got your, if you're, you're going to be killed tomorrow, you need some way to quickly get yourself in front of the Supreme Court. And that's what the emergency docket or the shadow docket was supposed to be used for, actual emergencies. 
emergencies where depending on the, the decision, if it's held by a lower court, is irrevocable by the time it gets to the Supreme Court. And thus it needs to, the Supreme Court needs to hop in without full briefing, without full kind of uh, uh, arguments on the case, and without full reflection on the issues, hop in, make an immediate stopgap decision, and then perhaps later at, at a more leisurely pl pl place, uh, pace review the situation. What the Supreme Court has done is taken that emergency process and then used it to push through a bunch of otherwise unpopular decisions, right? So instead of going through the normal process for full briefing um, uh, and, and full hearing and full consideration of issues for things that the conservatives on the court just want to do, they now use the emergency process or the shadow docket to do that. And that has come up a lot in the context of voting rights. Um, and voter suppression, because one of the things that the Supreme Court has done via the shadow docket is extend the penumbra of this case called Purcell. Purcell stands is, is a Supreme Court case that stands for the, the understanding that we shouldn't change a law about an election very close to the actual election, right? So like if you had a law saying that early voting started on Monday, you don't want to change when early vo voting starts the Friday before, right? That's kind of obvious. Um, but the conservatives on the Supreme Court have extended that logic to not just be right before the election, but to be, as far as I read Brett Kavanaugh's latest concurrence, to, to encompass a period of time that is that election year. So once you get into the year of an election, which happens every two years, let's not forget at the federal level, then allegedly you can't change any laws regarding a, an election to make it easier or fairer or, 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 or easier for people to vote according to the Purcell opinion. And the court has used their emergency docket or the shadow docket to push through this new understanding of Purcell. We saw it happen a bunch of 2020 under COVID restrictions with people trying to make voting safer during a pandemic and the court using their shadow docket to say, no, 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 you can't make it safer. And now in 2022, we're seeing the court use the shadow docket to enforce voter suppression um, through its emergency uh, hidden process. Thank you, Ali. Um, and in light of everything we've discussed today, what can the average person do to advocate for voting rights? Ali, let's go to you first and then to Will. I mean, I'm sick of telling people to vote harder, right? Like, I'm, I'm just, I'm sick of, I, I, I find that, that, that suggestion uh, just to, to be un, unrealistic given what people are doing. People are trying to vote. People are trying to vote harder. You can't vote, you can't out-organize voter suppression. You can't out-organize um, the election officials throwing away your ballot after you've cast it all right you can't you can't you, you, you can't organize around that so what should regular people do they need to demand from their elected officials that they pass legislation protecting the right to vote at a federal level that's it Either you pass something like the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, either you pass something like HR1, either you pass something like the Freedom to Vote Act, or you don't and you don't have free and fair elections. That's it. All right, we're, we're beyond the point. We're like, I'm just gonna make sure that me and two of my friends get to the ball. We're way beyond that point. So you go and you go to your, your senator and you go to your congressman and you get them to, you call their, their office every day and you get them to commit to passing voting rights legislation or we, we, live, in a, we, 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 we live in a fake democracy. That's where we are. Um, sure, no, I, I definitely, unfortunately echo everything Ellie just said um, about trying to get some kind of anything at the federal level to protect voting rights. Um, because I, you know, I, I think it's, it's, um, you know, obvious that as bad as the threats we've placed face the last two years have been, that they can still get a lot worse in the next few years. Um, you know, I would say beyond that, I mean, um, be a poll worker in the fall or run for County clerk in your County. Um, you know, I think those would be my next, Two best suggestions. I think as bad as voter suppression was in 2020, um, you know, 
I think things could have been a lot worse had we not seen a really great wave of younger people step up to be poll, poll workers uh, in the 2020 election because, you know, poll workers in the past have tended to be, um, again, retired people, uh, many of whom were understandably hesitant because of COVID to serve as poll workers around a bunch of voters refusing to wear masks in 2020. And I think a lot of civic groups did a great job recruiting a, a younger generation of people to be poll workers in the fall that helped keep a lot of polling places open that probably would have closed otherwise in 2020. Um, you know, again, I think we're seeing a lot of states respond to that uh, by going after poll workers. Texas has passed all kinds of new criminal penalties targeting poll workers for various things. Um, but all those things being aside, I, I think that's one of the, you know, most important things other than calling your representatives about federal democracy reform that, you know, somebody could do for the fall election is, is make sure that polling places in your neighborhood um, have enough poll workers. Um, and run for county clerk or another local election official position uh, if there's one of those up on the ballot in New York County in 2022, because there are certainly a lot of people running for those kinds of positions this fall who have absolutely no commitment to democracy. And it would definitely be a shame if any of those people were, you know, able to get elected without, uh, without some pushback. Thank you both. Uh, we are now going to go into the Q&A portion of the event. We've allotted about 10 minutes for Q&A. We're gonna do our best to address as many questions as we can. If we don't get to your question, I apologize in advance. So let's dive right in. Um, Will, I'm gonna direct this question to you because it connects to something you just said. One thing that there has been some concern about is threats of violence directed against election officials and administrators. Can you address that, um, what that's looked like, ways that that can be, you know, diminished, addressed, what can be done to address it? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think I mentioned this earlier that, uh, the Brennan Center works with election officials on a lot of this kind of stuff, and uh, we we polled election officials recently and found a pretty disturbing number of them um, were, you know, unfortunately considering leaving their jobs because of the kind of threats they've been getting, um, which have been, uh, you know, escalating really severely since 2020, and and since a a big swath of elected officials in our country have been intentionally spreading these lies that these election officials were involved in some kind of fraud. And it's a really serious problem for a democracy that's going to get a lot worse um, if, if we don't step up in front right now. Uh, you know, I, I think I've seen some encouraging signs from DOJ that they're starting to take these threats a little more seriously, get a little more proactive about prosecuting these threats because, you know, it's law is crystal clear. Making a threat against a public official is a crime under federal and under state law basically everywhere. Um, and I, I think it's it's good that uh, you know we're starting to see federal law enforcement take this threat a little more seriously. Uh, and I you know I, I think again this is something where strong federal democracy reform bill would be the best thing we could do to enshrine some new protections for election officials. Um, but that being said, uh, you know we already have very clear laws stating that threatening a public official is a crime, uh, and we just need to make sure that. You know, prosecutors are enforcing these laws um, to the extent they need to, uh, to make sure election officials can feel safe in their jobs. Great, thanks, Will. Uh, Ellie, this question is for you. What can be done to empower the Department of Justice to act here? And I, I think if you could also expand on some of the voting rights legislation that you had referenced in your earlier response. Right. So the first thing to do is to go back to January 6, 2021. Uh, that was the day of the attack on the Capitol. Yes, but that was also supposed to be the day that Joe Biden announced Merrick Garland as the attorney general. So the best thing to do would be to hop in a time machine, go back to that day and make Biden appoint Doug Jones or Sally Yates or somebody with a fire in the belly to go out and protect this democracy as opposed to Merrick Garland. That would be my first choice. Unfortunately, I don't have a flux capacitor. So the 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 next best thing is to seriously get in Merrick Garland's face. Like there, the Merrick Garland has a history of being a good 
dedicated, competent public ser servant. But as an institutionalist, what he has shown as the head of the uh, of the Department of Justice, what he has shown as the as the American Attorney General, is a concern for protecting his own institutional credibility, as a, as opposed to going out there and stopping wrongdoers. I don't think that we so much need new laws to make Merrick Garland do his job. I think we need Merrick Garland to enforce the laws that he already has on the books that should make some of this stuff illegal. As Will was saying, threatening a public official is already illegal. We don't need a new anti-domestic terrorism statute to go stop you from threatening your local election officials. You just shouldn't be able to do that. And, and Merrick Garland needs to get on the ground and get in the game and start prosecuting those people. So that's one thing. But in terms of the larger problem, right, our larger problem is federalism. Our larger problem is our antiquated, broken system that allows a, a federal electoral decisions to be decided on a state by state by state by state basis as opposed to having one standardized set of rules that applies to everybody in every state regardless, right? So the, 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 the point, the reason why I say the, the 1965 Voting Rights Act was the most important piece of legislation in American history is that that was the first piece of legislation that made the promise of universal suffrage enshrined in the 15th and the 19th Amendments real for anybody. All right, 15th Amendment didn't mean squat for black people living in the South until 1965. The 19th Amendment didn't mean squat for women of color almost anywhere until 1965. And all that we've done since, 1960, since 1982, when the Voting Rights Amendment was amended and expanded, was pull it back, pull it back, pull it back, until finally we get to 2013 and John Roberts cuts a hole in it in Shelby County v. Holder, eviscerating Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, and then we get to 2021 and Samuel Alito cuts another hole in it in Brnovich v. v. Arizona, significantly diminishing Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, and they ain't done yet. So the, then the most important piece of federal legislation then becomes the need to restore the 1965 voting, voting Rights Act to its former glory of literally just 10 years ago. If we're not doing that, then we're not making the 15th and the 19th Amendments real, which means that we're not really living in a democracy. Thank you. Um, one final question, and we have just a few more minutes left, but I'm hoping we can squeeze this in. This particular question uh, references Texas, but I know that this has happened in a lot of states. There have been huge numbers of mail-in ballots rejected after they were mailed in for lots of relatively minor reasons, right? You didn't sign in one of the three places you were supposed to sign or it wasn't dated or, you know, lots of relatively minor things that could have been cured but weren't for whatever reason. So in what ways could this have been addressed or why, why is this such a big issue? How can it be addressed moving forward? And Will, I'm hoping you can answer this in like three minutes because clearly it's not that big a deal. Yeah, sure. So to kind of, I guess, tell a quick story about what's happening in Texas. So in the Texas uh, March primary elections, we saw mail ballot rejection rates of like 20% in some counties, which is just ridiculous. Um, and those rates were higher for Black and Latino voters than they were for white voters in a lot of those counties too. Um, so, you know, uh, these rejections are happening because Texas Senate Bill 1 has this ridiculous identification matching requirement where you basically have to guess uh, which of your different state ID numbers you used when you first registered to vote and write the same one on your application. Um, but Texas Senate Bill 1 goes further than that to make the problem worse. So let's say your mail ballot got rejected in March. Um, well, you can't rely on a community organization that does voter canvassing in your neighborhood uh, to help you fix that problem anymore. 
because Texas Senate Bill 1 also created all kinds of new criminal penalties for these people, targeting the ways they can interact with voters when talking about mail ballots. Um, let's say your county election official is actually on your side here and wants to try and help you fix the problem. Uh, well, your county election official can go to jail for soliciting mail ballot applications or doing anything uh, that can be interpreted as soliciting mail ballot applications, which really limits the things your county election official can do um, to talk to you about mail voting and about fixing your problems. Uh, so you know, what Texas did with this bill was they created this ridiculous requirement um, that has no justifiable anti-fraud reasoning behind it at all. There was no mail voting fraud happening in Texas that this provision needed to prevent. Um, and then they put up all these other barriers on the people, the very people who would be able to help voters avoid this problem, um, uh, which is you know, really disheartening. And I'm, and I'm worried that a lot of other states are you know, going to see these shocking rejection rates and, and you know, feel like they need to try and do this kind of thing in their own mail voting laws. Uh, and you know, uh, as I mentioned before, the Brennan Center and ADL are currently litig litigating over uh, this bill. So I, I don't want to talk too much about um, you know, what I think is going to happen or could happen in Texas. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly think in, in plenty of other states that are restricting mail voting like this, uh, you know, we're going to need a, a level of organization over helping voters comply with these laws um, if, they, if they stay in effect. Um, that's, you know, got to be need, need to be very coordinated and very effective. Thank you. That was very efficient. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to Ellie Mistal and Will Wilder for joining us today. For everyone who registered for this webinar, you'll be receiving a follow-up email with more information to help you stay educated and involved on this topic. As a reminder, ADL is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization, and our focus is on ensuring that people have free and fair access to voting, not on telling them who to vote for. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day or as good a day as you can. Thank you so much, guys. Have a nice one. Thanks, everybody. Take care.